hip, hip, hooray for DNA. It provides the key to the plans for making everything in you and me. Before the 1900s, we were kind of confused in terms of what actually gave us our inheritance. So before the 1900s, this was when Mendel genetics just came about. We knew of these factors, but we didn't know what these factors were. We didn't know, were they proteins or were they something else? And that was more or less, that problem was more or less solved when Bavari, Morgan, etc. came along. So before the 1900s, we knew of these factors. Afterwards, we knew of that genes, we did not, not necessarily genes, but that these chromosomes played an importance. So in the 19, early 1900s, we knew that chromosomes were probably something to do with inheritance. And there were some of these genes on these chromosomes. We didn't know exactly what these genes were, but these genes were important when it comes to inheritance, and these genes were on the chromosomes. So we knew that chromosomes were to do with inheritance. But yeah, we didn't really know what genes themselves actually did. We know they're important, but we didn't know what they did. And that's when the next experiment came along. And that's what we're going to discuss in this video. This video, I mean, the dot point says, students will analyze information from secondary sources to outline the evidence that led to beetle and tandem's one gene, one protein hypothesis, and to explain why this was altered to the one gene, one polypeptide hypothesis. Right, so in this case, we're going to talk about now, these genes, how we actually got to know that genes produced proteins, or more specifically polypeptides, how that evidence started to accumulate, and obviously who did that. That's what we're going to discuss in this video. And we have to outline the evidence, that's the actual dot point, and explain why this was altered to one gene, one polypeptide. So first, let's we'll quickly talk about the experiment. Now, Beetle and Tannum, this experiment was conducted in 19... 41. And the experiment was done on the bread mold, Nurospara Kraza. Again, I'm not, sorry if I pronounced that badly, but that's the best I can do. And before I go into the actual experiment, the idea of this experiment was to look at a gene which was responsible for the production of an enzyme. Right? This gene was deactivated, and its enzyme was no longer produced, and thereby the mold died. So through this experiment, we could show that the gene was responsible for the production of an enzyme, Enzymes are obviously proteins, and so therefore, therefore we knew that one pro gene produced one protein. That's what the experiment showed us. I'll go through each step of the experiment. So this was the experiment. Again, it was done on the mold, on Nuspora Krasa, and the first step was to expose the actual mold to x-rays. So here we've got the, all the different moles here, and then we expose it to x-rays. And what would that do? Well, if we expose it to x-rays, that would obviously cause more mutations. And that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to show that a gene would be switched off. And how can we do that? We can do that through mutations. And in this case, the x-rays, after the x-rays happened, in the first step, we took all of those, um, we took all of those molds and put them into more beakers. Right? So we had beaker one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, et cetera, et cetera. And there were these molds in it. Our second step says place exposed molds into complete medium test tubes. What that complete medium means is it has all amino acids. Now, these amino acids, they will actually be produced by the, an enzyme. So the enzyme that is produced by the gene will help us make these amino acids. So the first step is to actually give all of the, uh, to give all of the moles all amino acids, just to double check to make sure if there's a problem with it growing, because it needs to have these amino acids, if there's a problem with it growing, it has nothing to do with anything but the enzyme being lacking. Right? So first to give all the amino acids to show that it's got to do something with the enzyme when there's a problem. And the second step is it grows the same molds in incomplete medium. Right? So now these molds, which all grew perfectly fine on the complete medium, you can see this part here, this means it's grown properly. Now they were all put into incomplete medium or minimum medium. And what minimum medium means, it means there were amino acids lacking. So there were some which were not there. So these were no, no essential amino acids, the ones that the enzymes create. And now what they found is we have a couple ones where there's no problem. So here, one, two has no problem. Four, five, six, seven, eight. 
etc. They have no problem, which means there probably wouldn't be a mutation, no mutation on those molds. Whereas there was no growth, so here, these didn't grow. And the probable reason why they didn't grow was because usually they would have an enzyme which would help them make these amino acids. But this enzyme would have been deactivated by the mutations. The protein would have been changed. The enzyme doesn't work anymore because of this new mutation. And that means that number three doesn't grow anymore. All right, so here we've got a problem. But now what we do is we grab the ones. So we just take the ones from the third test tube. So next is four, step four, identify mold that failed to grow. So we've identified that the ones in number three have failed to grow. So those are the ones we're going to take. We're going to take the ones from test tube three, and we're going to make more of them, and then we're going to take bits and put them into different types of test tubes. So you can see down here, we have, so, I mean, they've got letters written, ala, asp, gl, his. These are all essential amino acids. So now what we do is we put this failed one and put them into, into test tubes with individual amino acids. You can imagine there's always only one type of amino acid in each of these test tubes. So each has one type of amino acid. And what they find is, for example, in this case, with this, with this mold, if you give it methionine, right, if you give it methionine, which is, an, which is a form of amino acid, it will grow again. And the reason why it does that is because usually it has an enzyme which helps it make methionine, but it was actually deactivated through the mutation. But if you give it thiamine again, you're not giving it all of the essential amino acids, you're only giving it methionine. That's enough for it to be able to grow again. So in this case, we've, if you identified, okay, this certain mold seems to have a mutation that doesn't allow it to make the enzyme to produce methiamine. So that's what we've established here. We've, so we have established that this specific mold can't produce methiamine, and it's usually an enzyme which the actual mold would make, and this enzyme would help it make methiamine. So that's more or less the experiment. It was just there to help us identify what an, a mutation does to a certain mold. Now the conclusion from this experiment, we found out there was a gene responsible for the production of a specific enzyme that produces one essential amino acid. So for example, in this case, we had methiamine as the one essential amino acid. Methionine. So what this gene was responsible for doing was producing an enzyme that helped us make that methiamine. And without it, it would be dead. So without it, it wouldn't be able to grow. But if it had it, it would be fine. So, that, so there was a gene that made this enzyme. And the problem was that mutation. So the mutation we had at the beginning disabled the gene. So it switched off. And thereby, no enzyme was produced. So enzyme production stopped because this gene would usually produce the enzyme. Obviously, if enzyme production stops, that means methiamine production stops. And that means the actual mold can't grow. So therefore, we've realized one gene produces one protein. Why do we know that? Because enzymes are proteins. So therefore, we found a... We could actually... What, we, what they did then is they, they looked at the um, mold on, on a microscope and figured out which gene was actually not there, which was meant to be switched on, which one was different to what it was used to be. Thereby, they could pinpoint the gene and figure out, okay, this gene was usually responsible for producing this protein, this enzyme. And that was his exper their experiment in 1941. And then what happened is it went from one, pro one gene, one protein, to one gene, one polypeptide. Now there's a couple of reasons why, and they're pretty straightforward, because some proteins are made from various polypeptide chains. Right, so the example would have been hemoglobin. So you can see this is hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is actually made from four polypeptides. Each of these circles I'm drawing here, each of these different colored things, is one polypeptide. So we've got four polypeptides which are made by four made by four different genes and together they make one protein. So if you say one gene, one protein, that's not always true. It is actually true in most cases, but an example of hemoglobin, it wouldn't be correct because then you need to actually have four genes to make that one protein. But if you say one gene makes one polypeptide, that would be correct because one gene codes for one polypeptide. 
So I'll go over the actual top point again. So students will analyze information from the source to outline the evidence led to beetle and tannum's one gene, one protein hypothesis. So one gene, one protein hypothesis came about because they realized that a certain mutation caused enzymes to become deactivated and thereby their amino acids weren't produced and the mold couldn't grow anymore. And then they could pinpoint a gene which was responsible for making that enzyme and thereby they could conclude there's a gene which makes an enzyme which is in, in the gene and the enzyme itself, sorry, the enzyme itself is a protein. So we could say, okay, a gene is responsible for making a protein. But that it changed to one gene, one polypeptide because we found different types of proteins like hemoglobin, which actually consists of more than one type of polypeptide. So one gene, one polypeptide is more accurate. I hope that was useful. Thank you for watching.